It represents uh, fire and thunder and uh, force and energy and all those kinds of things. Uh, Oshun, as I mentioned, is uh, honey and rivers and love. Yemaja is, is the water. So you, when you go through all of the Arisha, you find an Arisha associated with each of kind of what makes up the world. Ogun, the rocks, of the world. R exactly, the elements the of the world, the energies, the, 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 the energies. No. That's, that's the key. It's energy is the key because we are all just energy. We're all, we, we are, sorry about that, we are all simply energy. And that, that those energy forces are embodied in the different Orisha. Now, um, you've, it sounds like you've traveled a lot around the world. And um, I'm wondering now if you could tell me about your first connection to East Cleveland, how that happened, and um, I know East Cleveland is in Brazil, but uh, <laughs> can you give, give me a sense of what it was like for you to be there. Well, um, I was probably, as a professional, associated with community development. I was president of the Fairfax Foundation, which was a neighborhood development corporation. And this occurred... That's in the city of Cleveland. That's right? in the city of Cleveland. Now, this was after I left Caramo. I was at Caramo for about 10 years. When I left Caramo, I, I became full-time, even though I was working with Fairfax part-time while I was at Caramo. When I left Caramo, I went full-time with Fairfax. And the idea was to develop that as fully as possible. And so we had partnerships with uh, the City of Cleveland, Cleveland Clinic, uh, and, and many other resources, uh, the Cleveland Foundation and others, to establish various programs and projects. So that made me an associate of other community development corporations in the City of Cleveland. And in that context, I became involved with the East Cleveland Community Development Corporation. Were you living in East Cleveland? No, I was time? still living in, uh, in Cleveland, and I was invited to, to sort of sit and help to find a direction and, and uh, uh, evaluate efforts and consider some of the issues. I mean, one of the things that we always talked about in East Cleveland is what would we ever do if General Electric left? Um, you, so that was before General Electric left. Um, about what year? Do you uh, well, this would have to be in the 70s. This, this, was, this was in the 70s and in the early 80s. Um, I moved into East Cleveland in 1979, and uh, I was as a result of, of a second marriage. And our home was there on uh, Windermere, near the corner. I think it was 1823 Windermere. And as I think I said earlier, it's now the expanded parking lot of the uh, East Cleveland Community Theater. And the interesting thing about living in East Cleveland, it brought back a sense of what it was like when I had lived in New York. Uh, in, in the, little five-story walk up and I mean you, you come down to the street and you're sort of right in the middle of all kinds of activities unlike living in the suburbs of, of Cleveland or my hometown a farm and when I lived on Windermere uh, you know you were right down the, right there on Euclid Avenue you were right down the street from stores and shops and and uh, uh, the library was, was down the street and Caps Pianos around the corner and uh, um, you, you had, you know, sort of a vibrant feel that, that made you, you know, think this is very urban, very, very urban. And I remember on the negative side, uh, the times when we dodged bullets, when the, the Amherst gang from the other side of Euclid Avenue would come and shoot up the street on Windermere. Apparently there were little gangs that feuded one another from time to time. 
And the, also the interesting thing was that the, the, that street was still integrated. It was still integrated. I remember there were a set of twins, uh, a couple of white boys who lived next door. And they're twins. They just fought all the time. They just would wrestle and tussle and fight, with, really fight, not just play, but fight with each other all the time. Uh, it was amazing that uh, they could actually live. But, but there were black and white families still living on the street. I'm and you not, say still, so are you talking about the time when East Cleveland started to shift? It had already shift? shifted, but I mean, I, it was probably at the transition. Um, I mean, there, there were, you know, East Cleveland, as, as you probably know, has a lot of very large, wonderful houses that are left over from those days when it was such a, uh, um, you know, wonderful suburban community for people who did well. You know, that, that, was, that was, you know, some time ago. but. Uh, we, we had a very large house there. There, there were a uh, number of children in, in that second family, my, my stepchildren. And they went to the East Cleveland schools. I was also a consultant in helping to train uh, teachers in East Cleveland to use uh, educational software in the classroom. I worked specifically with uh, Superior Elementary and Prospect Elementary mm -hmm. and worked with Shaw and worked with the high school. And um, it also extended to uh, um, Roselle as well. So I had a, um, and Caldonia. I worked, worked with uh, Stella Lomonts in there at Caldonia. Um, so I was very involved with, with the school system, the school board and the develop group, and everybody is looking at how can we make this a uh, better situation. Um, so at that time, living there and then working there, uh, it's, it's, it, it, it overlaps a little bit in, in uh, everybody trying to figure out what can be done to make East Cleveland a vibrant place. Uh, there wasn't a lot of, uh, well, there wasn't a lot of industry at all. Uh, the business strip was a uh, marginal business strip in terms of the types of businesses you, you had. I remember when at Superior and Euclid, there was a large car dealership. And when they left, there was a real wonderment of what would be come of that and eventually it became a, a community facility, a government type of facility, uh, which salvaged uh, that piece of land. Otherwise that, that would have been a, a real blow to see that uh, become vacant. But all up and down the strip there was not, um, th there was not a major draw in terms of commercial activities. Um, I remember well back in the day there was a uh, jazz club uh, there on Euclid Avenue. I, I think it's, it's right, right up around where McDonald's is on Shaw. And there was, uh, uh, I remember I went there one night, there was a group playing, um, oh, what is, is this? Tucker's Casino? No, no, not Tucker's. No, this was, uh, it's gone now. Um, mm. A friend of mine from the Wharton Center back in Philly, his son was playing in the band. His name was William Meeks, and he played the drums. And the group was just getting started. I, uh, it just evades me right now, but the lead, of, the lead of the group has passed on, but they became extremely famous. He did stay with the band, but, but East Cleveland could draw that kind of talent and that kind of entertainment then. Nowhere is, is, it, is, no way is, it, is it doing that now. Um, but East Cleveland has just struggled with the ability to raise resources in order to uh, develop residential and business activities. Uh, it, it just don't seem to have enough resources. 
really to take care of the basics. Uh, you know, just to, you know, I'm listening to this, no, I'm not listening, I'm, 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 I'm observing the conversation about the possible annex of Cleveland and East Cleveland and where there are some pros and, and some cons in that. Uh, it's too emotional an issue to ever think that we'll see that happen in the near future. But sometime in the future, that may become what the answer finally is. Um, I know that there was some discussion of Cleveland Heights and actually that part of East Cleveland, which is uh, filled with wonderful houses and the Caledonia that around that, that district. Uh, remembering that East Cleveland was once Rockefeller's playground, I mean, you know, his estate, there's obviously some wonderful things there in East Cleveland, just some tremendous physical assets with Forest Hills Park. Um, the uh, uh, you know, following East Cleveland all the way up to Bratnall and to the lake. I mean, the, the potential for developing just a wonderful residential community uh, supported by some kind of commercial activity that would generate sufficient dollars to make this viable has probably been what's been on the table that people have been about thinking, thinking about. Well, you were in a community development mode of thinking even in the 70s as it relates to East Cleveland. Yes. Um, then, what kinds of solutions did you, did you brainstorm about? Um, I heard you say, for example, that you were hoping that, that um, the electric that GE would never leave. Or yeah, well, that was, <laughs> that was always a discussion. Uh -huh. uh, but, but what kinds of brainstorming did you do in those days, and have you seen any of those ideas come to fruition? Well, the problem was we talked about a scattered site housing, but as soon as a house, a scattered site housing or a developed house would be possible, you lose five or six. I mean, it, uh, the, the flipping of houses in the wrong way uh, Describe uh, what scattered site housing is. Well, scattered site housing is you have a vacant lot in a block, and in and what you would do is to either a rehab or a new house in that block as a focal point to try to get development of that block. But there's a critical mass that you need if you're going to. Uh, bring somebody in who's going to have the best house on a bad block, or what can you do for these other houses where there, you have some good stock that you're working with? Um, so there was there was some movement in 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 rehab, uh, trying to get a rehab program. But again, we're we're always dealing with the lack of resources, and everybody was also trying to turn their attention to what kind of commercial development can you see that would allow enough resources to sustain uh, these developments once you got them in place. Uh, once, once commercial developments, uh, not, not residential developments were there, how could you sustain that? I mean, if you had the, a new house or two new houses on a block, how do you get those resources to do something with the rest of the block. You had streets caving in, you had streets that needed attention. You had vacancies, uh, would, vacancies would just come up so quickly and there was no demolition uh, to speak of. Uh, it was just an impossible situation of trying to balance what you could do with a single act of putting a house in a place, rehabbing a house, with everything else falling, falling down around you. Um, you know, there, there, was, there was discussion about uh, recruiting businesses to come into the area, recruiting industry to come into the area, uh, because there was infrastructure. There was, there was lots of potential land banking, uh, as an example. Um, what made that difficult to do? Well, I 
I think a coordinated effort seemed never possible. We never seemed to get all the parties who needed to work together to work together. You, you needed to have the state not trying to take over the city. You need to have the state sort of working with the city. Um, you needed to have uh, all the agencies sort of on uh, focused on on not a single issue, but at least all going in the same direction. And you didn't have that. We, there, there were just so much bickering uh, among the folks who sat on these boards and who sat on uh, uh, the councils, who had different agendas and had different reasons for wanting things to either get done or get different people in place to do them. Sometimes people who weren't competent to do them, but they were allowed to be there. Uh, I guess when you boil it right down, it comes to leadership. You know, not having that kind of leadership that could see a direction, put a plan, a, a plan in place, and then go after it relentlessly. You know, it didn't, didn't seem to see that. A lot of scattered activity. And I think if you look at what's happened with the East Cleveland Library more recently, that probably is indicative of what uh, the problem has been all along. Um, I have a friend there, uh, friend, associate, uh, Ed Parker, who was, uh, uh, you know, single-handedly, handedly trying to develop a block. Uh, with his uh, property development and his, and his enterprise, which he calls Snicker Fritz, and then trying to take his own energy into, you know, the library board to help give that some direction. And just what he described to me as the issues and problems that they were faced with, just trying to get something going rather than the dealing so regularly with bickering and personalities and other issues of, not of substance, but just of personalities. Uh, that seems to have been, because I, I remember the same thing was true when I would sit, I would actually sit with the school board in certain of their meetings. And uh, it, it was a similar kind of issue, but at the same time we did see all these brand new buildings <laughs> get built. Uh, and and Superior get rehabbed and, and expanded. So there was, the, the, on that issue, because there was money behind it, the money was earmarked, they could only do schools with it, they couldn't do anything else with it, that did get done. You know, that was, one, that was probably one of the few projects, the rebuilding of uh, the high school and the junior high school and the elementary schools, that was probably one of the few projects that actually got planned and executed and completed in East Cleveland. I just didn't see a whole lot of that happening otherwise. But then you had, like I said, you had a resource, earmarked money, that can only be used for that. And that was substantially after your um, time working with the, um, the community relations, not community relations, the East Cleveland Development Corporation. Development. Um, what we're in 2000, let me see, this is 14, those were done at the end of the 90s, uh, this was the 70s and 80s, yeah, it, 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 it kind of flowed, but you know, the, the back story to that, you know, started, uh, I don't know when those first uh, discussions were held, but, um, I think the high school was built in 2000 or something. Yeah, but I, I think the backstory they were those discussions probably started in the nineties, in the nineties. So we were we were not doing the community development discussions. They were probably in the late seventies and eighties. Um, and as I I might have, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but riding through East Cleveland now and seeing vacant lots and abandoned buildings, uh, lots of them, lots of them. And then thinking of where we are now in the 
the whole energy picture in the nation, there's a different perspective as to what might be possible. And then there's the solar field that's down at uh, Lakeview. Um, and you wonder now, is there enough leadership that can see the writing on the wall that with all of this vacant land or potential vacant land from buildings that need to be raised, it's not likely that that's going to become residential. It's not likely that people are going to rebuild for residential purposes and much of that. But the potential for energy development and you look down on Kinsmen and what they've done with the urban gardens and you take those two ideas of these urban farms, these urban gardens and energy development, and then you look at East Cleveland and you say, you know, there could be a match here. There could be a match here, you know, and, and maybe, maybe this is East Cleveland's time to actually be able to do that. Say more about what East Cleveland could do. Um, energy development, following up on this uh, 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 solar farm with wind, with more solar, with technology that maybe is still in the incubator stage that hasn't come out of this university or that university yet. East Cleveland might be the center where that could be practiced because you have so much land to work with. Uh, and what was the population of East Cleveland approximately? Uh, I, don't, I don't remember. That, that's a number I, I, I really can't. I've heard there were like maybe 40,000 uh, 17,000 now. You know, there were 20,000 people in the Fairfax neighborhood or thereabouts at the time. Um, you know, the 40,000 figure doesn't, doesn't sound uh, way off. I just don't recall what the pop. I, I probably have documents mm -hmm. that have all of that. I, I, um, I hate to cut you off, but I wanted to ask you to elaborate a little bit more about East Cleveland's time coming and what form that would take. Well, I'm not there now, and all I know is what I will read and what I will discuss with people, uh, what I see, but it just seems to me that one of the most obvious is the availability of land. In fact, when I get off of the main streets and I have opportunities to ride on some of the side streets, it's even more obvious that on the north side of Euclid Avenue, uh, there is an abundance of unused land. And it's not likely that you're going to attract some industry to come into that or some housing developer to come into that. Unless maybe it's going to come off of the Bratnall side or maybe come from the Cleveland Heights side into those areas. But in terms of th that opportunity to create more of the, and it doesn't have to be just solar fields like we see at Lakeview, but I'm just thinking of the technology that is yet developed. Um, for instance, let me just th throw this out. I know that one of the problems with electric cars is that they haven't perfected a battery yet. So um, if you're looking at a place to put a plant, let's say, that's in an urban setting where you're you know, doing some things that might relate to not so much providing just general electricity, but taking one of those ideas that's coming out of an incubator and you've got some really cheap land over here and you have some uh, electrical or some green power over here, um, that plant could get situated uh, in an East Cleveland where you couldn't draw maybe a car manufacturer or uh, a clothing manufacturer or, or um, some other kind of manufacturing possibility. But because if that gets 
earmarked as a green area in the future than green industries that, that may not have to do so much with just general power but have to do with the other things that you need to help create a green industry like the battery for example once that idea is perfected and we know how that's done that kind of industry might be drawn to uh, uh, with the right leadership at the state level and at the county level and at the city level to bring that here rather than in an obvious place like Colorado or Arizona or, or some other place where you've got tons of sunlight and tons of open space and so on and so forth. In the same way that we got the medical mart here uh, because there were people who absolutely devoted themselves because of all of the medical uh, facilities there were that that would be a, a great economic and, and um, uh, community development move. And then we looked at uh, this whole convention issue and they said, well, we don't have enough hotel rooms. And suddenly you got hotels going up all over the place. And lo and behold, we got the Republican Party convention. But I think that's another issue. I think the Republicans just, I mean, that's, that's another issue. But I, I, I just think that East Cleveland, if it could identify itself as a center for green development, if it could just see that mission as becoming the center for green development, and then moving all of its energy and forces towards that, it would attract things that it had never thought about before. And with that solar field, now I assume that's commercial. I'm assuming that's not the city that's putting that out there. It's too big just to be a university project. I think it's a commercial project that somebody's got pretty smart to say, look, we've got this land sitting out here, it's cheap. Uh, it, it'll give us an opportunity. Uh, I, I actually worked with a, a, a solar project when I was with Fairfax. This would have been in the uh, uh, early 70s. We actually converted one of the homes on East 86th Street to a, uh, a, a solar facility. You know, put the panels on the roof, put the rock uh, uh, bed in there and uh, water and all that sort of stuff. Using a government grant to do that, uh, we had a project where NASA did a flyover of the Fairfax area and uh, recorded the infrared uh, uh, rooftops mm -hmm. and determined, you know, the amount of heat that was being lost and, you know, came up with some numbers and some statistics and then we had this project to develop what was the first solar urban home probably in the nation. Um, it's since gone, uh, but the interest in what could be done with solar in the northern part of Ohio uh, is, is not something that is off the books. I mean, in, in those days, everybody thought it was off the books. You couldn't do anything with solar in this area. Mm -hmm. But now people recognize that you can do solar anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can do partial solar, partial natural gas. Uh, at night, you're running off of natural gas, and the day, you're running off of solar, and there's enough savings to make it viable. But that's just a project, but I'm talking about if the city sees itself as a green community, if, if, if all efforts go to make this a green community, if you have efforts that say, we're going to look at <coughs> um, how many rooftops can we get with solar panels? How many uh, gardens can we get that uh, uh, relate to you know, urban uh, farming? If we, if we just see East Cleveland becoming, in its time, a green center, that might bring out things that we never thought possible to solve the problem of what to do with a community that otherwise looked like it's dying. Does that make sense? It, it makes a lot of sense. Um, what's your fondest memories of East Cleveland? Hmm, interesting. Hmm. 
Well, I mean, it, 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 it probably had to do with working with the schools. I mean, I, I did have an opportunity to work uh, directly with teachers, principals, students in um, affecting how well they were going to do in math in particular, math and reading, and how this has a direct effect on their scorecard as a school district as it relates to how well they did with the Ohio proficiency. Um, my role there was, was as a consultant, as training the teachers to use software that would uh, help students very effectively. The software is proven software. It's still working today. In fact, my grandbaby uses it at the Shaker School. Uh, she went in at 7 o'clock in the morning to spend her uh, 15, 20 minutes on MCS, uh, a product of the Pearson Company. Well, that, I was a consultant first, uh, and then I joined the Pearson Company to continue to work with the same uh, software. And, but it got me into a, a lot of different situations. I worked with, in that capacity, I worked with the school board and worked with the principals and worked with the teachers and, and worked with the students. And I think that was probably the most uh, memorable because I was having, as an individual person, I think having the most impact uh, there. It wasn't just sitting around and, and talking about what we might be able to do, but actually getting something done and, and seeing the results of that. I want to go back to um, when you lived on Windermere. How did you happen to move there? Did you know much about East Cleveland before you moved there? Well, yeah, I, I actually knew about East Cleveland, uh, but the house was uh, my second wife's home, and it was actually uh, re rehabilitated through uh, uh, Lutheran Housing. Actually, the Lutheran Housing actually did the job. You know, again, here, uh, this community development uh, activity and knowing these organizations and knowing that work, I find myself now the recipient of that kind of thing as a result of them coming in and, and rehabilitating that house. And it, like I said, lasted for, for a couple of years and then it became a parking lot. Um, but the, 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 the stay as a resident of East Cleveland, um, again, brought back memories of, you know, really living in that urban environment. Uh, there was, it, it, it was interesting and being able to walk somewhere to get something and didn't have to drive to the store necessarily, just, or being able to walk to the rapid stop and ride all the way to the airport if I were going out of town, you know, things of that nature. Um, but you mentioned also a safety issue with the gangs. Well, yeah, that, that was true in Cleveland as it, as it uh, was there, but that, that, was, that was a particular relationship between the, the boys on Windermere and the boys on Amherst. That, but that was a, seemed to be a, a, a rivalry between those two streets. Uh, there might have been, you know, some other uh, enemies that Amherst had, but I seem to recognize how they were uh, always involved in, in fussing with somebody on our street. But uh, you know, the, the, some interesting folks on the street, like I said, that it was still somewhat integrated, and these big, beautiful houses, uh, and a little short street, it just went you know, from, from Terrace to uh, Euclid, and it was mostly intact when I was there. I, th I think they've lost a lot of houses since then, but it was mostly intact then. Uh, and other than for those few times when, you know, they did ride down the street and want to shoot, uh, it was enjoyable living there. And again, it was that, that sense of being right in the midst of, uh, urban life. Did you work in the city of East Cleveland at the time you lived there or did you work outside of the city? Uh, when I was living there, I was probably working in Fairfax, uh, but involved with communities around the city. 
Now, you mentioned early on that um, you were an artist, both, um, it sounds like, musical arts. I was a singer and a painter. So, um, did you bring that sense of yourself into East Cleveland when you lived there? Did you do any arts work? Well, you know, I stopped painting when I moved from art director to administrator at Karamu. And so by the time it was early 70s, I had pretty much stopped studio painting. Uh, the, the issue had always been, it's hard to stop studio work to put your suit on to go to a meeting, uh, or even to clean up to go to a meeting, let alone putting on a suit. So the, the, the decision didn't come overnight, but gradually it got to the point where I had to decide whether I was going to be an administrator or an artist. And I think doing uh, the kinds of work I was doing, both at Karamu and around the city and in East Cleveland as, as an administrator, uh, my artistic interests were always there, mm -hmm. but not something that I personally would promote, but I was always interested in how they came out in the planning and in the uh, uh, discussions about what could happen. Uh, I was obviously I'm, I was always willing to support something that was creative, mm -hmm. uh, something that would, uh, uh, you know, whether it was you know, a mural that was suggested somewhere or supporting an art project that was developing somewhere. Um, you know, and then of course, it also overlapped with technology because I was training teachers on computer software in the classroom. So, so you know, as, as we move through, my, my uh, functioning as an administrator is probably what, what you know, was the strongest impulse. That, so they weren't the two aspects of yourself were not uh, in competition, one supported the other. I would think so, yes. Um, how has East Cleveland changed over time? Uh, it not only has diminished in population, but has diminished in terms of its ability to, to sustain itself not even grow, but to sustain itself. Um, when I was doing my master's, one of my classmates was the uh, deputy fire chief of East Cleveland. And uh, you know, we talked, and he talked, and you know, it, was, it was always quite clear that the, the, the problem of resource was at the core of a lot of issues. When you think, you know, a city is supposed to have, you know, enough money to pay its police, its fire, pick up the garbage, you know, pay its, its administrative folks and grow. But it always struggled just at that level, just at that level of, of just being able to uh, uh, sustain that. And now I think that uh, it, those resources are continuing to shrink. Um, and, you know, the idea of, you know, the state getting more and more involved in the city's management, you know, the, either the state or the county, or, but probably the state getting more involved because of the, the lack of resources and maybe some other issues too, which I'm not really aware of, but, but it's getting more and more difficult to do much more than just make it through the day. And therefore, even to consider what needs to be done on such and such a street or such and such a block or what such and such business people might require, um, there's no resource to follow up on that. That's what I see now. Having, at a time, there were at least, you could put committees together, you could propose things, you could even propose to, you know, to solicit the state for funds uh, to do certain things. 
But today, if you're soliciting funds from the state to do something, it's to sustain, to keep the doors open, not, not to uh, plan or carry out a plan. And I think with the loss of population and the loss of uh, uh, a, uh, a growing population of people who want to make a commitment to the city, I think you just have left people who have had East Cleveland as their home who just are not going anywhere. But you're not attracting folks who are coming in to say, this is a place that I think, you know, compare that to downtown Cleveland as an example, where when, Ralph, when Frank Jackson was running for mayor first time around, he said he was not looking to create an environment that would attract people into Cleveland. He said specifically, he wanted to make it better for the people who were already living here. And then later, there, there could be an influx. That was his mantra, and I, and I respected that. And I think East Cleveland is not at a point where it can make it better for those who are there. And I think you got to start there. If you can make it better for those who are there, then you can start attracting both uh, business industry and residents who might want to make this a place because it is extremely convenient, well located, uh, uh, it's lush, it's plush, it's, it's got all that potential, but uh, I think most people who live there feel that they're not going to get much more than what you see. There's, there's, there's no icing on this cake, uh, and the cake is becoming crumbs. Now that's just a view from without now. I mean, I'm not, I'm not looking at it and I'm not in the mayor's office, I'm not at the state office, I'm just looking at public general information about what's happening now. Um, why did you stop working with East Cleveland? Um, as it relates to the Development Corporation, I think that was just a matter of uh, maybe the turnover in membership, turnover in leadership, you know, just, just sort of the, you know, naturally you work with an organization in that capacity for two or three years and then there's a, a turnover, new people come in, that sort of thing. In terms of the work in, uh, in the schools, well, I had three different things happen. One, I had a contract with the County Board of Education to work in the East Cleveland schools as independent. And then secondly, I had a part-time job working for Computer Curriculum Corporation as a uh, consultant assigned to East Cleveland. And then finally, I was hired by Pearson full-time and East Cleveland was one of my assignments. Uh, and when those were over, then I'd stop working with East Cleveland. Now, in terms of uh, any other association, I mean, I'd, I, I was never on the library board, but I knew about library activities and I was actually asked to come in, as a potential to, be, to come in, and to work a uh, retreat on rules for the East Cleveland Board. <laughs> that that's actually didn't occur, but I was, I was asked to consider doing that. Is that a recent request? Within the last year, within the last year, to, to, to go over a retreat specifically on Robert's rules. And uh, the gentleman that asked me to consider that eventually resigned from the board himself. Uh, it, was, it was in such a turmoil. And I knew the uh, libraries, some of the library employees, and that got caught up in the firing and the hiring. And so I was more aware of that. And this is just within the last two or three years. Um, actually, I, was in, I had a business partner who was all up in Bob's and that. Charles was a business partner of mine at one point, so we've always had, you know, some information flowing back and forth because Charlie's involved in everything East Cleveland and everywhere else, I guess.
This breaks what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, at, when you describe how cheap Cleveland had changed, East Cleveland had changed over time, do you know what contributed to the changes? If you were going to describe what caused the changes? Well, <clears throat> actually, my son, Michael, uh, lived in East Cleveland. Um, don't remember the name of the street, but the, uh, the uh, Kenny King's restaurant, which has since closed, was on that corner. And his house was the house just before the viaduct. Um, and I recall just using that example of the Kenny King's closing and the house next to him was vacant and the house on the other side became vacant and the viaduct had a constant uh, rumbling of trains. And so eventually it was just not tenable. Uh, as houses become vacant and uh, vandalism took place and no one moved in and there was no rehab, uh, whoever was left had no incentive to stay or to make major investments in the property or even try to get the landlord to make major investments. And I think that what happened, when you have uh, a recycling of people in a neighborhood where one group leaves and another comes in, like Glenville as an example, you know, people left and others came in and they continue to invest in some small way or in some, in some cases large ways in those properties. What was happening in East Cleveland, it seemed as though if somebody left, nobody came in behind them. Uh, I had a friend who had an apartment building on um, uh, uh, Brynmere, and this is Anita Merriweather. She had, she and her sister had, uh, what was it? Uh, how many suites? It's a big. It was a big enough building, seven, ten suites, and they lived there. But it got very difficult. Uh, you know the. They were investing in their building, and, but everything around them seemed to turn into mud. And so they finally got discouraged, and, and she and her sister just got out of it the best way they could. She now lives, I, I'm not even sure where she is, in Canton or somewhere, and her sister's gone. But there was nobody coming in, and nobody came in behind them to take it over. It wasn't as though they'd left and somebody else came in. When someone left, in most cases, it, it was abandoned. Now, I don't know how much of that had to do with, with, with uh, the availability of financing, but I suspect that redlining was, was involved in that. Uh, but that's not anything I can back up without research. But there were not folks coming in to replace those that were either leaving as a result of a change in circumstances or they'd just gotten worn out or families that simply uh, passed on and it, if the property were passed on to the younger people in the family, they didn't make an investment, they didn't stay, they may have tried to rent it out to somebody and they didn't pay rent. I don't know how much of East Cleveland is on subsidized rental or subsidized uh, uh, families with, with, with subsidies, but uh, certainly a good deal of it is and those are not folks who are making investments. It's, it, you know, and, and you know, it's like with Shaker and Cleveland Heights and even Cleveland, you have pots of money for people willing to invest in those properties that they'll make available plus all sorts of resources. You know, I was reading about the Cleveland Heights has just got, uh, you know, the, tons of programs now for people to invest in their property. So they're taking down very few homes because there's always somebody who's really willing to come in and to uh, continue that uh, development of that property. But that was not the case in East Cleveland. Do you know why? I think it's a, it's, it was the lack of hope that they wouldn't just be stranded. Um, uh, I'm taking, a, as in, in Anita's case, Anita Merriweather, her case was 
we've taken this as far as we can take it, and uh, we've, we've invested in it. Uh, you've got tenants that don't have a lot of resource, um, or there's not a lot of help. I think it gets down to not just resource, but also the, the, the psychology that this is not, it's not an investment that's going anywhere. It, and if you can get out, get out. It's, it's not as though I'm going to plant my stake in the ground here and I'm going to make this work, like an old pioneer. Mm -hmm. uh, it, now, going back to what I was saying before, if somebody was saying, and it was being felt, understood, and believed that this is going to become a green capital, then I think that same energy would be, I'm going to stick this out, I'm going to get whatever morsel of investment I can find and stick this out because I'm going to be a part of this because this is going somewhere. But I think people were feeling it's going nowhere. Now I'm going to shift a little bit uh, to ask you this question. How has race impacted on you personally? Race or racism? I'm old school. I lived through racism. You know, I went to the skating rink and got rejected because I was not white. Uh, and this is in Vineland, this is not in the Deep South. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've, I've uh, gone to movie theaters and couldn't get in uh, as a child in my hometown. Uh, you don't come to the Landis Theater, you have to go down to the, this one down here. And you can only come here in the afternoons. Now, those issues, uh, you know, we could man up and push and even get through some of the barriers just by doing that. But you get very deflated, you know, as, as a kid, you know, being forced with that. When, when uh, Howdy Doody first came on the air, uh, 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 Bobby Redding got the first TV. And he invited the kids over to come watch Howdy Doody. Because Mommy said, I couldn't come in then. I couldn't come in. Um, I, wanted to join, I wanted to join the Scouts, and I couldn't join that troop. No, that was as a kid. You know, I'm 10, 11, 12, 13, 15, 17. Once that happens to you, it stays with you. And when you look out and you begin to evaluate what's happening in the world, that's part of the calculation that you're applying out there. So I'm a product of that, unlike uh, my son, as an example, who would ride his bike through Murray Hill and not be worried. I'm working at Caramu, and the executive director, Jay Newton Hill, is living on East Overlook, and his house is bombed. So I have a different attitude about white folks in Cleveland Heights. And a uh, folk singer who shot and killed at the top of Cedar Hill. You know, those things resonate with me where my son, you know, he, he came here. He, he was uh, uh, three years old. And he's in Cleveland on East Boulevard. And then we moved to uh, uh, Shaker. Uh, like, you know, Ashby and he bought a house on Hildena. They went to Shaker schools. And he rode his bike all over the world, all over the place. And, and he wasn't affected by that because he didn't have that experience in his background and only read about in the book, maybe. So it still resonates with me. I'm still with it. I'm still not a fan of Israel. And the reason is because Hamas is like, it's like they treat black folks. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, you got all these folks crammed up in this little area, they're going to act out. Ferguson is just another example of all that pent up stuff. Uh, and I see that and I know that, you know, at the, at the base of that is racism. And then I hear a policeman say, either shut up or get shot. And then you look at that the cultural view of that. It reminds me of slavery. Shut up or get shot. 
shut up or get whipped. Uh, I'm, I, I just cannot be uh, objective about the relationship of white and black folks. Even though I grew up with a lot of white people, um, that DNA still lives in them. And my DNA still lives with me as to where we came from. Um, and that, that, that issue has yet to be resolved because when I hear a white person say, well, that wasn't me, that happened, I mean, I wasn't even here then. But yet when you listen to the logic of how they got what they got and what that economic resource was, you know, the city club speaker just last Friday laid it all out, the case of reparation, and said again, made it very clear that it's only logical for you to say that if this much resource created, and it's, it's the slavery, mm -hmm. created what the United States' economic benefit is today, that some part of that ought to be paid back to the people you stole it from. You know, and, and I listen to that logic, and I think, well, that sounds logical to me. <laughs> it makes sense to me, because that's where I grow from. But then I can listen to, you know, a young black man out of, you know, coming out of school, bright, saying, I don't understand it. I mean, you know, I'm, I've got white friends, black friends. I mean, that, well, what is this? I mean, that was years ago. Why are we talking about that now? <laughs> they, just don't, they just don't get it. They don't feel it. They don't think it's, it's real. They don't think it's important. So do you think it's an age difference? No, it's not an age difference. It's not age. It's understanding. It's, 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 it's DNA. Uh, because that same guy is going to feel it one day when, when it hits him in the face. And he gets stopped by the police. And the police say, shut up or I'll shoot you. Uh, or in so many ways. And because you just... You're just a black guy. I don't care what you think. You're just another black guy. And it'll begin to dawn on them that there's, there's a great divide in how we think about how we live on this earth. Now, interestingly enough, in Africa, when we went to the market in, uh, in Lagos, I saw maybe three white people, but I saw, saw 25,000 black people. The feeling was so different, you know, you, you know, I didn't feel, I mean, maybe I stood up taller, <laughs> maybe I just felt really like, hmm. <laughs> you know, I see what the homeland does to you when you, when you get that feeling that this is, this is ours, this is mine. I'm, I'm not the minority that has to shut up or, be, or get shot, not that the the black people, people, police wouldn't shoot us either, because we got stopped by them for pennies as a, uh, you know, a dash. you know, they they would hold us up. Uh, I know I had one strip search me, you know, and and we were fortunate because uh, a busload of of uh, uh, visitors was around the corner, and it was a much more lucrative possibility, so they ran from us to them, and the taxi driver that was taking us around said, come on, let's get out of here, and he drove away, you know, and so I didn't really lose anything, but, you know, they could have taken everything we had just because, I mean, I'm, I had a money belt on, and, yes, I said that on, you're Naira, <laughs> you know, so I'm saying it isn't because it's black that I, that, uh, that I didn't fear I was going to get shot or get hurt. Uh, but the difference of the, the energy feel in Africa when you're among black folks who themselves felt like they were home, this is theirs, that's what rubbed off on you. That you, that you rubbed, they rubbed off on you. This is their place. When you're here, th that doesn't rub off on you. What rubs off on you here is that you're an outsider, um, you better be careful, you better be careful where you walk, and you know that this white lady's gonna cross the street if you're walking down here and you can see her clutch her purse. Even today, as, as, as I walk down the street, I'll see and feel that. So you, it's, it's all of that that makes you know that race is still alive and well, and race relations and race conditions and racial attitudes are still alive and well. Um, so it's just something that's in my makeup, and I'm going to probably go through life 
the rest of my life with that. Uh, my son won't. He doesn't have that. Uh, and he must have missed the experience somehow. He just missed that. Um, he's not unaware, he's intelligent, but he just missed it getting into his bones. Um, so, how do you think race or racism has impacted the Sudanese people? Oh, I think people view that as a, a colored town. And as long as that view is held, uh, there are going to be very few people who are willing to stretch for it. Um, you know, there's a lot of the you get what they deserve uh, attitudes. Now, sometimes you think that, well, those are attitudes of, you know, just people that don't matter. But, you know, those attitudes are right within the minds of those people who make decisions about money. You know, it. it you know, you strip away from uh, bureaucrats in particular, the people who run agencies, I'm talking about governmental agencies now, and the people who are in elected office. It's the same people, they just have a title. That these attitudes uh, permeate that that's a uh, color town. It doesn't mean as much as Lakeview or Parma. It, it, you know, we're not as concerned about it. Uh, maybe it should just it should be taken over by the state, you know, it's just, just a colored town. That, that racial attitude on the part of people res with resources, until it identifies itself, until East Cleveland identifies itself as having a purpose, um, they'll be offered a purpose, and that purpose is to be nothing by those people with resources and they're only give lip service to doing anything more than foreclosing on it uh, until it steps up and says, we have an identity, we have something that uh, in the future will make us you know, one of those places that have led the way to where we need to be as a society, and I believe that's a green town. I believe that's the only thing I'm going to save East Cleveland, is becoming a green town. I don't see it becoming a Cleveland Heights, you know, a bedroom community where people would want to go and raise their family. Uh, I mean, it will be part of it, that will definitely be part of it, but the identity of the city will be if it, if, if it, a green town. That, that's what will cause a different view. Can you think of a time in your memory instances when the community of East Cleveland fought for something? Well, you know, the interesting thing is the current uh, uh, discussion about annexation is causing the people of East Cleveland to kind of step up and say, hey, wait a minute, we have, I read one article where the lady said, well, look at your police force. Y'all shot these folks, uh, 127 times, a uh, cop jumps up on the hood and shoots 10 shots right into the windshield of these unarmed people. And you talking about being our police force? We love our policemen. You know, I, I read that, I don't know where, was that Scene magazine or somewhere, I'm reading that article. And I know Scene digs up a lot of dirt and, uh, you know, they're not the most reputable uh, invest investigatory source. But at the same time, that issue is probably the one that's bringing East Cleveland's current voices to the fore of not to be annexed. I mean, that's that, it's coming up from that point of view, not to be annexed. Now, in the past, uh, I mean, the issue of General Electric was always something that, that, that people would, that, that would bring voices. Um, but I don't, I don't recall any other, I mean, other than the political stuff, you know, the, the, the issue with the mayors and, and council. Um, but, but no project or venture, um, closing of the branch library, um, but that's economic reasons. Um, I 
I can't think of I can't think of an event that's brought East Cleveland voices out where they're really, you know, gung ho about an issue as much as I feel that this uh, annexation issue is beginning to bring them out beyond just the local elections from, you know, from time to time where people uh, have voiced, you know, one opinion or another. So outside of the city or from your position as an outsider now, outside of East Cleveland, mm -hmm. um, you didn't hear the, the outcry of the hospital closing, Cleveland Clinic, um, Hero Road Hospital? Uh, You know, those kinds of things were so inevitable that the outcry, you know, it, it was we build the, the, the Stubbs facility and we close the hospital like that's a quid pro quo, you know, like that, that's, that, that's, that, that's, I, I just saw that as inevitable. Uh, and, you know, whatever protest there was, it wasn't going to make a difference. It's not like when you wanted to build a high school, I mean, a highway through Shaker Lakes and there was protest and you don't see no high, hi, highway you know, across Shaker Lakes. It wasn't that. It was, yeah, there were some voices that said this is, this is not a good idea, but it was inevitable that that was going to happen. Uh, I was surprised it happened so quickly. You know, once it became public, I, I thought there might be some delays here and there. There could be some rationale. But then, you know, the building of the, of the medical facility uh, that's there on Euclid Avenue was supposed to take the sting out of that. And apparently it did, uh, sufficient for it just to happen and for us to see all that land again, all that vacant land with no plan that, I mean, I'm an outsider, but I see no plan for now what to do with all that land. That's a big piece of land. That's left. Well, when um, when we think of East Cleveland and and its changes, one of the changes is a racial the racial composition of the city. And um, but I'm thinking when you were working there. Was that a time when East Clevelanders fought for anything? Could, do you have anything in your memory when they, East Clevelanders stepped up and fought for something and maybe were effective in their fighting? You know, in my mind, what I'm doing is I'm going up and down streets. You know, I, we talked about the car dealership. We talked about Noble Road and GE, it was two anchors. Um, you know, I remember when uh, uh, the Timors, you know, started the Wendy's there on Euclid Avenue. And, that's, and then that turned into a kind of a medical or community facility or something. Uh, um, Other than the schools, other than the building of, of, uh, of the schools, I can't remember any issue that brought East Cleveland really out. I mean, there, there were issues that brought people out that related to uh, some violent matters, some police matters, uh, gang matters, uh, killings and vacant houses and that sort of thing. But uh, nothing that was for the city, you know, uh, people coming out on behalf of the city. Uh, I'm, I just can't come up with, uh, I just can't come up with anything. I mean, you mentioned the hospital. I was aware that it was being closed, but my point of view was it was inevitable. Uh, you know, Cleveland Clinic seems to, see, I, I live with the Cleveland Clinic there in Fairfax. You know, I listened to their planning, and I knew Irv Franklin, a realtor who 
was hired by East Cleveland to buy the properties that they, not by, by the clinic to buy the properties that they wanted without all of the commotion that this is the Cleveland Clinic getting this property. So I was aware of those kinds of things. So when the clinic wanted to, you know, to, because it owned, it owned the hospital um, in the way it owns all the hospitals around the city. So when they got ready to act, I, I, it was just an inevitable thing. Uh, it, was, it wasn't going to be stopped by protesters or, or by protest or letter writers or petitions or any of that. Um, unfortunately, I can't think of anything. As we, as we move toward um, um, the issue of fighting for something that actually is effective fighting, um, can you talk a little bit about how the surrounding institutions and cities impacted East Cleveland? The only institution that I'm thinking of that had impact was the state and their relationship with the city. Um, but that was always from the point of view of uh, either for, forestalling bankruptcy or uh, helping to, uh, well, put together a plan for financial recovery, which I still don't think is done. I uh, still don't think there's a plan. But that's the, that's the point of view that I think of the state having as related to East Cleveland. I don't think of, of any particular action the county has taken regarding East Cleveland. I mean, I don't, uh, I don't know what, you know, <clears throat> such things as if we build, a, if we're going to build a facility, let's build it in East Cleveland and help with its development. I haven't seen that. Did I miss that? <laughs> Is there, did the county put a building there for uh, county administration? I mean, they put a building on Quincy uh, with, the, with the Fairfax Renaissance Group and made that a viable addition to the community, but that's because the county made that investment. I haven't seen anything like that occur with East Cleveland. I haven't seen anything from the state or the county related to that, uh, uh, that would assist in, the, in its development. Uh, Cleveland Heights, as far as I could remember, because of the school relationship around the Caledonia area, there had been some discussion of uh, an annexation of that nice little part of East Cleveland that involved that area, uh, but that was self-serving because that's all they wanted is just, you know, get, get some of the nicer parts. But there was no real sense that there was anything being given that would help the city. Um, so I don't see it where, he's, where, and Brattonall had no interest in moving its borders south uh, to pick up any of East Cleveland's issues that, that, I, that I'm aware of. And nothing from any of those other suburbs out that way. And then uh, only with this discussion of annexation from Cleveland. Uh, unless, I mean, I could have missed those discussions, but I haven't seen where anybody's shown any interest. Um, any official organization, uh, agency, municipality has shown an interest in doing anything. It's East uh, Councilman from Cleveland and from East Cleveland have been convening meetings where there was discussion. Um, I'm, um, what about the other institutions like Case Western and uh, the other large institutions that um, could impact on East Cleveland in some way or another? Well, you know, you had those uh, housing developments on the fringes, um, which it probably helped. But that's not East Cleveland, that's just a fringe, both around uh, the university circle area, you know, Euclid Avenue and the Viaduct, you know, those, those houses have been developed in there. But that's still not East Cleveland. Uh, even the uh, pre-clinic is in Cleveland. 
It's not East Cleveland. Uh, Lakeview Cemetery is still, well, it extends into East Cleveland, but, you know, there's been some fringe activity, but nothing that's in East Cleveland, nothing that's actually in the city that I've seen from uh, Case or um, Western Reserve. If that, those are student houses there at Lakeview, but they're not in East Cleveland, though. That's still on the, that's still on the Cleveland side, isn't it? Um, I think it's shared. That's the, the name that's given to it is a shared name. Hmm. But it definitely is fringe, definitely on the fringe. Yeah. And then as you go up Lakeview, the only development I see up there is that uh, electrical transfer station you know, up on Lakeview. And then, of course, you have the Neon Center. Um, it's on uh, Lakeview and Superior. And that's, and, that's in, and that's in Cleveland. There is a Neon in East Cleveland, on Euclid. That is Cleveland at Lakeview and, uh, and uh, Superior? Right at the edge. Mm. And Euclid, uh, the Neon Center in East Cleveland is where? On Euclid, not as far, not as far east as Shaw. But, um, Same side of the street? As, uh, as uh, across the street from, from the high school. Oh, okay. Hmm. Interesting. Now, I know I asked you about racism and, and uh, race and how it impacted on you personally. Now, this is a slightly different question. How has inequality impacted on you personally? I don't think it has. I, th I think I'm one of those people who have uh, uh, found a way through the doors, you know, where, you know, they say some people got the benefit of affirmative action. Um, I think I probably am more part of that group than the other group that sat on the sidelines and said, uh, you know, we're getting the shaft all the time. Um, my career has always gotten me into places where, you know, uh, other folks maybe didn't have the opportunity to get to, but I've always managed to, to get through that door. Uh, you know, I was, I was able to go to Harvard and uh, uh, spend time up there, both uh, learning and, and teaching. I was able to go to a number of different places. I, from Harvard, I got an invitation to go to Australia to the Arts Council there. Um, and just getting into Cleveland to work at Caramu. Was, I mean, doors have been opened to the point where I, I was not feeling personally uh, a victim of inequality. But I could see that others were. You know, uh, I could see others were. I mean, I'm, so from a personal point of view, that has not been a stumbling block for me. And then there were things that I turned down that uh, would have been uh, even more an indication that I had opportunities others, you know, just didn't have. Uh, particularly when, you know, Boinovich invited me to join his staff. and. Uh, and was very, very serious about that. And that was not a matter of inequality. That was on the opposite side of the page. So no, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like that has been a personal problem. That, I don't, I don't, you know, I'll see all this other stuff and I know racism exists, but I don't see that as a, that inequality as a personal problem or a personal issue. Uh, is there any way that you see that inequality has impacted on the city of East Cleveland? Yeah, I, that's what I spoke of before, is that the people who make judgments, who have resources, uh, still see it as a colored town that doesn't need that kind of 
we're not going to give it that kind of help. It should get its act together. You know, it, it it's it's just filled with gangs and uh, people ripping off the welfare system. And that attitude is why people who are in position to make decisions that could help the city, bureaucrats I'm talking about now, not the policymakers, but the bureaucrats who make the decisions. The policymakers follow recommendations of the bureaucrats. If you're a director of something, uh, you're a supervisor of something, and you put your recommendations together, the policy person, that board, is going to look at those recommendations and usually follow them. Not, they're not going to question the, the, the recommendation of those people that they've hired to do all this preparation. And I think the people who are in those positions uh, don't have a good view, positive view of East Cleveland having any beneficial uh, uh, qualities that would cause them to say it needs this assistance. Now, is that a race-based inequality or some other kind of inequality? I think it's race-based. I think it's uh, uh, a, a prejudice against uh, uh, poor people as well as, as uh, African Americans. Uh, I think it's a combination. You know, it, it's. Uh, I think some of that same attitude would be held against people who were white and poor. I think they'd feel the same way about tra trailer park town. I think they would do the same kind of thing, but you double that with the racial attitudes, and you 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 get a, a, a doubling effect of resources not being provided. You know, you have to wait till the street caves in before you can get some help to fix, you know, the, the cave in in the hole. It's not people are not going to come rushing and saying, well, they need this need this help desperately to, to get these streets in order. When was the last time you saw a street repaired in East Cleveland that wasn't uh, the result of, of a sinkhole in the street? So you, des you described a bit about your vision for the future of East Cleveland. If you had a vision for how East Cleveland could prevail, let's say. Um, if you could say a little bit more about that and um, talk about I any way in which you would be, be prepared to participate in making it better. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm kind of stuck on this issue of a, a green town. And um, I think it's a matter of the, the uh, leadership of Cleveland, uh, East Cleveland, and the, um, the people themselves recognizing that there is a need to self-identify as to what our, what, what our mission is as a city as it relates to this 21st century trip that we're on. And the two things that come to my mind are green and technology. And, and that's because I don't see residential and industrial development. I don't see those two things as having any traction for where people will rally around the, a, a development in East Cleveland. Maybe it's the solar field that makes me feel that way and my own interest, personal interest, in uh, what solar can become and, 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 and what green is in general in the sense that um, I know there's a lot of resistance to uh, a green society because people are embedded so much in what they already have. Uh, even if they, if, if, even if it will destroy the planet, we just we're okay if you spill oil in the Mississippi, if you spill oil in the Gulf, if you spill oil anywhere, if you spill it in the ocean. We just come to accept that as 
well, we need, we need the oil so bad it doesn't matter, not recognizing that pretty soon you won't be able to drink the water and you won't be able to breathe the air. So being committed to green does not take a lot of, of uh, uh, consideration. It's a, there's a lot of logic that says we have to move in that direction. And it's obvious if you're out west and you're in open territory with sun, you know, 90% of the time you can think of solar as being important, but, but you got 10 people out there. Now here you have tens of thousands of people and you're using up lots of energy and you need, in this area, uh, you need that energy source and you need those things that relate to energy development. And the battery issue was just, you know, one of the things that I, I, I was thinking about because that seems to be what's holding up the electric car is really the battery that would provide all that's necessary. So industries that work in those areas, not necessarily the battery, but industries that work in those areas that may just be experiments in a, in a college lab somewhere where they're still working out these ideas of what this could be and what that could be. As an example, I always thought that someday somebody's going to develop a road surface that will resist uh, snow and sleet. Uh, the, the chemical reactions will turn such that you don't need to use salt or, or uh, uh, bulldozers or, or you know, the, the snow removers and all that stuff. That kind of technology is, is going to be in the future. And if East Cleveland is a place where those things can be manifest because it identifies itself as a green and a technical uh, center, plus people live there, plus people shop there, plus people raise families there. But, they, they, but the focus is it's a green community. That to me seems to be a way out. Uh, right now, it, it, it's hardly able to sustain itself as, as I see it as an outsider. Uh, you know, just keeping the doors open it seems to be about all it's able to do and the state standing in the ready to take over at, at a moment's notice. Uh, and I don't see where it can go out and recruit an industry to come in and to provide, uh, you know, 500 jobs and a, a plan is going to locate in East Cleveland and it's going to provide uh, a thousand jobs and, you know, those kinds of things aren't happening even in our urban centers where there's a lot more resource. So in, in that regard, with your vision of what East Cleveland could be. Um, my last question to you, and I suppose it's also kind of a challenge. The last question, wow. Yes. Um, it's a challenge, I think, that is an integral part of the Voicing and Ad Action pro Project. What would you be prepared to do to participate in making East Cleveland better? Well, I have uh, a project in mind for myself that has a relationship. I mean, I'm, I'm interested right now in sustainability uh, as it relates to nonprofit organizations. And that fits right in to what this could be as a self-identifying green center, green town because the issues of sustaining whether it's a nonprofit center or a nonprofit organization or a city has to do with what kind of innovations can we develop and I would work in a situation like that. I'd, I'd give a lot of energy to that. Uh, <clears throat> I'd join committees and boards and do work and consult and um, um, offer voice to that kind of issue. Um, but there has to be a, a self-identification. I'm not going to, you know, beat on this dome 
and say, I think I got an idea here that you might be interested in, but I would participate if there were, uh, not, not even a groundswell, but if there were a really solid group of people who see as a mission to identify all of the opportunities, all of the opportunities that could be brought to bear in making this place a green town. And uh, we can go to work on that one. And I'd, I'd be very committed to working on that because it also fits what I'd like to do in general you know, with sustainability. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add um, as we wind down to the end of our interview? Well, you know, I've, I've, I've been working since 1960. And I've just been trying to figure out uh, what I'm going to do with what I've learned. Uh, and I've come to the conclusion that uh, it is in the area of, you know, uh, community, sustainability, nonprofits, and it's always driven by a creative and, and uh, uh, artistic sense so that it, is, it, it isn't just to get it done, but it's to get it done in a nice way, to get it done in, a, in an attractive way, in an aesthetic way. Um, so this, that always is going to be a, a, a part of it, that that should be included in that. And um, it, isn't, it isn't just to salvage East Cleveland. It's that we need that somewhere. I don't see Shaker Heights becoming a green town. You know, I mean, yeah, people will get solar this and solar that. In fact, I talked to a friend about, uh, you know, maybe we can actually go into the business of, of uh, getting folks to uh, put solar panels in their yard, on their garage, on their house. Not, 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 not uh, big deal, little deal, little deal. You know, you put a solar panel up here and you um, uh, power your night lights. You know, that kind of, that kind of deal. Um, I'm just thinking that we, we really have to deal with the issues that relate to our changing environment, our climate change, our destruction of the planet. Uh, not so much for ourselves because that transition will, will be gone. But for those that, that we're leaving it to, we don't want to just leave them a, a, a junkyard of uh, 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 I'm just looking at, at the possibility of what's happened with uh, the, the um, polar caps, you know, the ice, the ice, uh, the ice caps, how they've, how they've melted and now the weather is affected by how this uh, northern cold now doesn't just stay up north, it keeps dipping down, dipping down further and further and further, and what that's going to do to our winters and what it's already done to our summers, and lightning strikes and people burning up our forests and tsunamis and uh, hurricanes and tornadoes and all this stuff. Um, it isn't just what's happening with nature, but it's also what we're doing to our own planet, you know, and, and, and how we're and 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 how we're not facing up to it, how we're just letting uh, one oil spill after another just become a way of life. So it, it you know East Cleveland is an opportunity to make a change in that because it has resource in land proximity. Um, because unless there are people who need this energy, I mean, it's in just an isolated village out in the middle of Colorado, there's not the same impetus for that. But, but to see that demonstration of a green uh, town where you, not overnight, but transition from uh, uh, pulling on the resources to adding to the resource and being futuristic in what could be done here and attracting uh, people who have that same interest. And I think if we probably did some, I was, I was reading about uh, the Forest Cities group 
who do urban development and the kinds of things that, that they do in their planning and how much green they try to get into that with the buildings that they build or rehab or, or, or reposition. And at some point you would attract that kind of um, interest in East Cleveland. I think when they were at the City Club, when the director of that division was speaking at the City Club, somebody asked the question of, well, uh, what would we have to do to get that kind of interest here in Cleveland or East Cleveland or whatever? And he said, uh, you ain't got enough money. <laughs> you don't have enough money. You don't have enough infrastructure. You don't have enough whatever. We, we like big projects. It was that kind of attitude that came back from the uh, uh, speaker. Um, you don't have enough, it's not enough incentive for me to get involved in mm -hmm. little stuff that you got here. Um, I mean, that was, that was the attitude, not the words, but, but the attitude. And, but if East Cleveland uh, muscles up and says, we, we're gonna be a green town, you know, let everybody come and see what we're trying to do here. What are they doing in European places? What are they doing in Australian places? You know, it's like Brisbane was created out of nothing. I mean, it's a modern city. It was just created out of nothing. And uh, so they try to do uh, things there that are forward-looking and contemporary. Uh, East Cleveland, forward-looking and contemporary. I mean, yes, it was Rockefeller's estate, but it's just time to move on from that. We need a different kind of green now. We need a different kind of green now. Thank you. Thank you indeed. I, I just, this is wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing um, your experiences and your insights. Um, you know, we're going, to, we're going to make use of those ideas that you were discussing and perhaps we can find a cadre of people who would be able and willing and commit to commit well, the people are there. It's just that they have to know that East Cleveland is the center for us to, you know, get this discussion going. But people are all over the place who, who believe like that. And we've got a White House that is committed at the moment to that kind of thing. If there's a connection between the White House and East Cleveland in that way, uh, you could be fast-tracked. You could be fast-tracked. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. I appreciate it. I'm sure there's something you can cut out and something you can use, but uh, it's from the heart.